Well, hi again, everyone. It's Rob Ryder. Happy New Year on January 2nd, 2024. And today, is that your signature? Prove it. Not that easy to do if you don't do it right. And if you don't do it right, well then, that's not your signature. It's just a scribble on a piece of paper. Come to find out, they got a procedure for these kind of things. And uh, that's part of what we're going to talk about today. I am Staff Sergeant Robert Allen Ratluski, U.S. Army veteran, also known as Rob Ryder. And my email address is courtofrecord at AOL.com. You can find me on YouTube at Rob Ryder with three B's, R-O-B-B-B-R-Y-D-E-R. So, yeah, um, you know, a lot of times you're asked to provide your signature. And uh, so you sign it on a piece of paper and you send it to wherever it's going to. But that's really no proof that that's your signature. It's just somebody signed a piece of paper or scribbled on a piece of paper. And uh, so if you needed to do every jot and tittle of the law before you could get relief from the government, then that would be a big deal. If they've asked you for your signature, then we need to make sure that they agree that that's our signature. So let's talk about that and how we might use it and um, some other things I found here just recently. So give me a second to load a few things up and we will be on our way. Hang on a second. So while this is a work in progress and it's uh, you know really geared to, towards something I'm doing myself, if you stay to the end, you'll see that well, you could maybe use that in your court case. Uh petition for relief, whatever you want to call it, that you're trying to get something done, and uh, and a way to make a record of it, and some other interesting things that I've come across since I tried this uh, relief one way, and I'm going to try it another way, because the first way doesn't appear to have worked. And the first way was to try to do what it said in Title 31 of the United States Code in Section 3702. Right, 31 U.S.C. 3702, which is authority to settle claims. And it says, except as provided in this chapter or another law, which turns out to be quite important, right, right there, comma, all claims of or against the United States government shall be settled as follows. Before we get into those, see here they call it the United States government. Other places we're going to see they call it government of the United States. Or they don't call it this. I don't, don't even believe they're the same thing. It's just you'll see United States government and you'll also see government of the United States. Well, the people are the government of the United States. We the people. The United States government is the thing that's supposed to do the stuff for us. It's kind of how I'm looking at it. But, uh, you know, when you're looking for all the differences to find out why something doesn't work and compare it to what you should have done and so forth, you know, you come up with a whole list of things. So anyways, in this, it said then that the Secretary of Defense shall settle claims involving uniform service members' pay, allowances, travel, so forth and so on. Um, okay, so it would sound then that if I had a claim for pay, I would take it to the Secretary of Defense. That's simple enough. Then it has these other ones, if it's civilian or so forth to do, and you get to be in a claim against the government, presented under this section, must contain the signature and address of the claimant. There you go. Signature of the claimant. Well, how do you prove that that's your signature on the document you're going to send to the Secretary of Defense? Right? You, I mean, I know that you know that it is, but how do they know that it is? Well, they have things to make it, you know, so that you can say that it is your signature. But continuing on, the claim must be received uh, by the official responsible under subsection A, so in my case, Secretary of Defense, for settling the claim, or by the agency that conducts the activity for which the claim arises within six years after the claim occurs, except, and it goes on with some things. So, you know, this telling me that if I want to send a claim for pay to the Secretary of Defense, I have to make sure it gets to the Secretary of Defense. Well, I tried to do that, and, uh, you know, the Secretary of Defense has his own mailing address, 
which is Lloyd J. Austin III, Secretary of Defense, 1000 Defense, Pentagon, Washington, D.C., 20301-1000. That is the mailing address of the Secretary of Defense. And so I paid uh, 13 bucks to mail something to him, to that address. But what happened? Well, you know, I did the tracking, and it said, okay, we can look at delivered. Delivered individual picked up at the postal facility. That's what's up here now. Right at 10.33 a.m. on December 11th, 2023, in Washington, D.C., 20310. By Pentagon, 20301. R6. Item was signed for by N. Turner. Well, there's something wrong with that because I didn't send it to this post office where it was picked up at. I sent it to 20301, which is the post office that never made it to. They're claiming that somebody from Pentagon 20301R6 picked it up, but that isn't where I sent it. Right? I mailed it to the Secretary of Defense at his mailing address, right? Which is 20301. Not 20310. So obviously, you know, somebody's intercepted the mail. And that's, uh, what do they call it? Obstruction of the mail. So, anyway, you know, so they did. And I said, oh, shit, now what are you going to do? So I, you know, I did a complaint to this uh, Inspector General of the Department of Defense. And I contacted the post office, but I'm really not expecting either of them to do anything. This is just, you know, another scheme that's being laid so that uh, what you're trying to do doesn't get to where it's going to. So then I say, oh, shit, now what am I going to do? Well, let's go back and read it again. What did it say? And we go on and we read some more, blah, 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 which, you know, most of this you can read yourself. It don't have much to do with what I'm trying to get to. Which was down here where it says, well, where this section came from, right? So 33702A, which is the part talking about the Secretary of Defense, right, comes from the statutes at large. Well, that's good to know, out of 42 Stat 24. So there is a, I don't think I pulled it up, but there is another United States code. Hang on just a second. Uh, one, one, one USC, one, one, two. All right, this is a Title I, United States, uh, again, United States Code, Section 112. Statutes at large, contacts, admissibility, and evidence. And it goes on to talk about them, and it gets down here and says, the statutes at large shall be legal evidence of laws, concurrent resolutions, treaties, international Agreements other than treaties, proclamation by president, and so forth and so on, and in all courts of the United States, and several states. So this is like the common law of the United States and the statute at large. Right? It would be something that they're talking about when um, in the uh, sixth article of the Constitution where it says this Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, of which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and judges in every state shall be bound thereby, anything in the Constitution or laws of any state, to the contrary, notwithstanding. That's pretty plainly written, and I'm saying, well, then the statutes at large are these laws of the United States that they're talking about. So let's go look and see what that had to say. All right, let's go see what the law said, not what the code said. So when they first wrote it, it was a law, later codified. Where is all these things? Okay, so 42 stat 24. Let's go find that. Uh, so I took this out of. Title 42, the statutes at large, you know, and it's for the 67th Congress because the titles don't correspond to the Congress number. It just depends on how much they wrote each Congress did till they fill a book up and they go to another book. 
So this is Title 42 we're talking about, even though it's for the 67th Congress. It's 1921, and this is page 20. So this would be like saying um, uh, 42 stat 20. And we're looking for 42 stat 24. So if we go down here, there, 22, 23, 24. We see we're talking about a guy called the Comptroller General. And it says, uh, section, so this is section 305 of this particular law that's been written here. And it's saying that section 236 of the revised statutes, which I'd really like to find, if somebody knows what revised statutes are talking about, and what section 236 is, and you can find a copy, please email it to me at courtofrecord at ALO.com. But nevertheless, section 236 of the revised statutes is amended to read as follows. All all, A-L-L, -L, all claims and demands, whatever, by the government of the United States or against it, and all accounts, whatever, which the government of the United States is concerned, either as a debtor or creditor, shall be settled and adjusted in the General Accounting Office. Okay, well, when we were looking at this first law, This one here, right, uh, 37.2, it said, except as provided in this chapter or another law. Well, here's the other law they're talking about. That all this stuff, whenever it finally gets done, is going to happen at the General Accounting Office. And you're supposed to be able to file a claim with the General Accounting Office. And I want you to notice this has claims and demands. We're going to get into what the definition of these words are pretty soon. And you'll see, well, really what we need to send is a demand, which is a claim. It's in the definition, where the definition of a claim makes it more like a lien, right? And so you have to do the demand first, and if they don't answer, then you can do the lien. But you have to start with the demand, which is still a claim to ask for the property. You know, that's, again, this is just by reading definitions, saying, well, what, what did that definition just say? But anyway, so I said, okay, well, I should be able to file a claim then with the... Um, Comptroller General Office, which is the thing I'm going to try next. And, uh, you know, what led me to do the research on these other parts we're going to talk about here. But before we get there, um, you know, because this part I'm talking, I'm doing it as, a, you know, an enlistee. There's nothing special about me. I'm an enlistee. Any enlistee can do the same thing I'm doing. None of us enlistees have been released from the military. We don't have a discharge order. You know, I've, God knows how many videos I've done about these things, so hopefully you've seen some of them if you're a veteran. But if not, well, you know, take it from me. You're still in. And uh, the reason is under Title 10 of the United States Code, which is the one for the Armed Forces, in Section 506, it says uh, an enlistment in the regular Army, regular Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and in fact, at the beginning of a war, or entered during a war, unless sooner terminated by the president, continues in effect until six months after the termination of that war. So in my case, I enlisted during the Cold War. So I enlisted during a war. And that war ended, I don't know, uh, late 90s or something, I don't remember what it was. But it, it didn't end until after the Gulf War had started. So while I was in, then still, because I was in because of the, the Cold War, the Gulf War started. So now it would carry over under that. And, uh, you know, and so we're owed pay. We've been somehow, uh, as I've shown, you know, they, they take the name that's on your documents that you're going into the military under. Let's just take a minute to show this again. It's, it's always good to look at. Right, it's all based on this. If you're an enlistee, right, you had some form of document like this, where they're going to identify you by your last name and then your first name. Right, Ruluski, Robert Allen. So that's the identification of the of the for the record or the contract we're about to go into, which is this agreement here. <clears throat> and part of the agreement says that uh, entitled to receive pay allowances and other benefits as provided by law and regulation. So as long as I'm enlisted. I'm entitled to that. That was my point. Well, I'm still enlisted. Just because your records are wrong isn't my fault. And at, uh, you know, the age of 60, 
you can claim you can go on retirement if you've been in the reserves or some other form of the military. Right? I mean, you can retire after 20, or you can retire after 30, 35, whatever it is. But if you're a uh, reservist, then you can retire at 60. So that everybody who served in some way has a retirement coming to them at age 60. Right now, you know, we're not getting that. But it is being paid, and it's going into this thing called the Military Retirement Fund. That when you, you know, go and take a look at the audit, I've shown this in other videos, but you can just find it yourself, Military Retirement Fund Audit. You'll see that in this fund is like $1.3 trillion, with a T, trillion dollars of paid retirement pay. It's in an account. It never went to the retiree. Well, then who are these retirees that aren't getting paid if there's $1.3 trillion of their pay sitting in, a, in an account? Right? That's us. That's our money. So we got to put a claim in. Say, hey, I'm not getting paid. Actually, we got to put a demand in claiming we're not getting paid and see what they do. But uh, a couple other things in this form real quick, because we all have these, right, is uh, it goes on further, and they have one, Ray Lusky, Robert Allen, right, with my Social Security number, where I signed as Robert Allen Retluski. But then they had another one where they have you sign when you're doing your oath, and they put an X in the box, and then they have you sign your name, right, Robert Allen Retluski, because that was the name I put in this box. And here they only use your last name, right? How come they didn't put Rulewski Robert Allen likes on the first page? If that was the idea that, uh, you know, what does that name correspond to? This name? That's the one that has the name. It's the only one that asks for a name. Everything else is a signature. All right, signature. And they got type name. Okay, well, it's still backwards. So the name was still the way it was in the first one. Now, how come this one isn't the same? This should say Rulewski Robert Allen. Whoops, they didn't do that. Now, this one doesn't have an X in front of it. But when I went to the regular army, it does have an X in front of it. Right? So it's like, shh, what a mark, have you signed your name? And you did it in front of a witness, and he witnessed that you did it, and so forth and so on. Okay, so somebody witnessed your signature. So there's the first thing. Well, who's witnessing your signature to say that's your signature? Which is part of what this thing is we're talking about. Um, but this is the agreement that we have that allows that says that we should be paid and get allowances, and uh, you know it's not happening. And I'm saying that somehow, right? The guy on here, Rutluski Robert Allen, he never left the MEPS station because when I left MEPS. To go to Fort Hood, Texas, my orders were for Rutluski Robert A. They weren't for Rutluski Robert Allen. Never got an order for Rutluski Robert Allen ever. <laughs> and I'm, you know, would say we you probably have the same problems to your paperwork. So, anyways, that's you know that's what this is about. So, how are we going to claim this? And uh, now the way since I couldn't claim it through. USC 313702, I'm going to try to claim it under 42 stat uh, 24. Let's go to that real quick. Okay, so um, none of these things ever line up number-wise. So in Title IV of the Code of Federal Regulations, which is supposed to be where, in this case, the um, Comptroller General, you know, under the law, was supposed to write some procedures on how to do things. Well, they end up in this Code of Federal Regulations. Now, this is the regulation that's supposed to be filed to implement the law that was passed by Congress. And in uh, Part 30 of Title IV, is, uh, it talks about uh, things to do with uh, claims against the United States. Right, authority, 31 U.S.C. 711 and 3702. Well, we were just looking at 3702, and U.S.C. 711 is basically just says that the Comptroller General can do whatever the Comptroller General needs to do to 
carry out his duties. Right? Claims against the United States. Now, again, this is Title IV of the United States Code. But when you go to find, let's say you go to the electronic version of uh, Title IV, and you look at it, or you just download the, you know, tell you what, the complete package, there is no 30 in here, right? They've been, uh, subchapter C and D are reserved. And yet, it's right here, right? And it's got the eagle at the top. This is authenticated. This is what the government printing office says. This is the, you know, Federal Reserve or the Federal, um, go to Federal Regulations. So I don't know why it's not in the complete when you go to look for it, but it, it's you can find it this way by doing a search for 4 CFR Part 30. All right, and you're looking for Subchapter C, Claims in General. And it says this part describes or prescribes the general procedures applicable to claims against the United States, which must be adjudicated in the General Accounting Office or in an agency out of whose activities the claim arose before payment is made or denied exclusive to the transportation claims. So in my case, the agency that I would be dealing with is the Army, really, not the DOD, right? I, uh, the Department of Defense is an agency, but so is the Department of the Army. <laughs> but that's not the agency that I am uh, uh, was told to go to under 30, uh, 3207. I said, you'll see the DOD. Okay, well, nevertheless, it also said, if there's another law, use it. Here's a law, uh, 42 Stat 24, and here is a procedure for filing a claim or to uh, adjudicate a claim against the United States. So, unless otherwise specifically provided, claims will be considered only when presented in writing over the signature and address of the claimant. Well, there we are again. You, the claimant has to put his freaking address or his, his signature and his address. So how do you prove it's your signature? And truly, I mean, how do you even prove what your address is? Well, I think there's a way to do it, right? But you just can't write it on a piece of paper and give it to them because that isn't, there's no proof. You know, that's the same when, uh, after the fiasco, uh, election in 2020, where you had all these people that were, you know, I kept talking about all these affidavits that have been filed, and yet people, the news are saying that there's no proof any of this had happened. Well, that's because an affidavit is not proof. An affidavit is an oath. Nobody filed any proof. You may use an affidavit in your proof, but it's not the proof. The proof is what was written, not the affidavit. So this is all done intentionally. This is why they do this. It's Esquire trickery, right? They call it an affidavit instead of calling it uh, your sworn statement, which is really what it would be. You're going to give a sworn statement that has an affidavit in it, but it's a sworn statement. It's not an affidavit that you're filing because a sworn statement is a form of evidence, and evidence can be proved. But oaths are oaths, and they can't be proved. An oath is whatever the oath is. But if you didn't, um, uh, prove your signature on your oath, then, you know, who's to say that you signed it? And so they have us down, you know, the devil is in the details, my friends. It's all in, the devil is in the details. It's these little freaking things to do with grammar and sentence structure and what's the definition of a word and so forth and so on that, you know, that we need to get straight if we're ever going to get relief. So, right, over the signature and address of the claimant. Okay, well, I got an idea how to do that. Generally, no particular form is required. Okay. Uh, succeeding parts of this chapter and specify different forms of claims. Okay, so you don't, you know, it could be in a letter format. You just have to make a claim. But really, you have to make a demand, which is a claim. Because that's what the definition says that a demand is. We'll get there in just a minute. Uh, where a claim should be filed uh, in appeals. A claimant should file his or her claim with the administrative department or agency out of whose 
activities a claim arose. Now, again, that's for a claim, right? And this said that the guy can uh, adjudicate, uh, where was it? It was here, All right? Claims and demands. Okay, well, we're not talking about, uh, right? All claims and demands. So if you had a claim of saying you'd send it to your agency, well, what if I have a demand? I wouldn't send it to my agency then. Right? I would just keep it in the general accounting office because he has the a duty or the authority to settle both claims and demands. Anyways, he or she may appeal the determination of claims group, general accounting office, claims which cannot be resolved at the partner agency shall be transmitted to the claims group, general accounting office, Claims referred by agencies or by claimants to the general accounting office or correspondence regarding a claim should be addressed to Claims Group, U.S. General Accounting Office, Washington, D.C. See, here they put the address in the frickin' regulation. Where in the other one, it just said uh, you have to contact um, the Department of Defense, Secretary of Defense, you know, and you're responsible to make sure he gets it. But then they never gave you the address to send it to. I used the mailing address they gave, and, well, it didn't make it to that. It didn't even make it to that zip code. So when I do this one, I'll be sending it to that address. Right here, right? Claims Group, U.S. General Accounting Office, da 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 Okay, all claims against the United States government, right? United States government, not government of the United States, although we should see that here soon. Uh, except as otherwise provided by law or subject to six years. Okay, and one of the one of the caveats of the six year thing is if it happens during a war, which everything that do with us has happened during a war. If you're a veteran trying to put in a claim like I am. And uh yeah. So how do we get all this done and get the dang thing? properly formatted, right, do form a law to be issued or sent to the uh, Comptroller General, the Claims Group, U.S. General Accounting Office. Over here they had another, Claims Group General Government Division of the General Accounting Office. Right, they have a different address. Claims Group, General Government Division, U.S. General Accounting Office, Washington, D.C. You know, they don't have any room numbers or anything else to say that there's anything different. It's just uh, they added this thing called the General Government Division into the address. Okay, well, I have to keep that in mind. Right, so... Uh, <sighs> All right, we need to prove our signature. So here's a DA form 2823. This is the sworn statement form used in the military or in the army. So if I wanted to do a sworn statement, right, I could do this. I put your name in there, want to, you know, make the following statement under oath, blah, 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 what it is. And you get to the end and it has this affidavit here, right? So again, this is not an affidavit. This is a sworn statement, but it has an affidavit in it. But it isn't just an affidavit, it's a particular kind of affidavit. Because guess what? There's numerous kinds of affidavits. Just like there's numerous kinds of uh, habeas corpus. They only ever mention two, but there's, you know, a list of them someplace. That's, you know, those are common law terms for the laws of England. So whatever they said then is what they are, right? And there's many forms of affidavits. One of them is the one called a self-authenticating affidavit. And that's what this style is, where not only you, but two witnesses are going to swear before a notary or somebody who's uh, authorized to administer oaths, right? If you did all that and sent this in, well, then that would be, um, your signature would have been verified. So... 
There's a couple ways to do it. Let's see what it says here. So uh, self-proven affidavits, uh, self-proven affidavit, a sworn statement attached to a will. Well, that's one thing. Or if we just say lowercase will, then that's the thing you wanted to do, right? Your free will act, not a will as a dead person. Uh, the affidavit is signed by the will maker and witnesses, right? Signed by the will maker and witnesses, and it attests to the validity of the will. It is not necessary to include self-proving affidavit. Uh, it is not necessary to include a self-proving affidavit, but that's what we want to do. Properly written, signed, and witnessed. And the uh, will is legal without it. But including one may help probate go more quickly. So, so anyways, there's a couple ways to prove Well, One is to do it in open court. And I have to laugh because that's what they did to Rosita one time in her court case. She had a traffic case and she was like, you know, in the room and they're calling people up. And the only thing the judge was asking each person when they came up was pointing at the document and saying, is that your signature? And almost everybody said yes, right? So in open court, they testified that that was their signature on that ticket or on that contract as, you know, really what it is, something in commerce. Because you're in traffic court and traffic is commerce. Just look up the definition of traffic in a dictionary. It's about commerce. So when Rosita got up there, though, and she said, is that your signature? Rosita said, uh, well, I'm not a handwriting expert. I can't tell you, which stumped the judge. It didn't end her, you know, her deceitfulness, but got her on the one that she was getting everybody else with, and she had to dig deeper in a bag of dirty tricks to figure out how she was going to, you know, get Rosita to agree to the contract. And I don't remember what she did exactly, but they moved on to something different. But the point is that that was the thing they were asking. They were, you know, oral testimony in open court. That, that was their signature. It was all that was required. That's one way to do it. Another way is, well, get two witnesses and a notary and you all in a room together and everybody agree that that's your signature and then they have to agree it's your signature because you did it with three witnesses. Really four because you're, you know, you're always a witness. And the, the notary really isn't there as a witness. They're there to administer the oath. That the three people are all agreeing they all did this together. As we'll see, there's a you know, way that they write the wording. So let's take a look at one. Hang on. Yeah, self-proved will. That's another name for it in Michigan. A will may be simultaneously executed, attested, and made self-proved by acknowledgement of the will by the testator and to witnesses sworn statements, each made before an officer authorized to administer oaths under the laws of the state in which the execution occurs and evidence by the officer's Certificate under official seal is substantially the following form. Now, there's a whole bunch of things that just happened in that one sentence there that if you just did it the way that you wrote, that it's been written, you probably would not do it right. Right, which is um, by acknowledgement of the will by the testator. So in our case, though, we're not doing a will. So let's we call that the, um, what are we supposed to do? Claim or... Demand. The demandant and two witnesses sworn statements. Each made before an officer authorized to administer oaths under the laws of the state in which the execution occurs. So if that's the notary public, then so be it, right before a notary public. And evidenced by the officer's certificate under official seal in substantially the following form. It's that officer's certificate and official seal that we'd have to talk about because the notary doesn't have that. You have to go down to the county and ask for their certificate of authority. That allows them to be a notary. You know, the proof that the person really is a notary is kept at the freaking county building in the clerk's office. And you can go there and get a certificate of authority. Let me, let me show you one. So like in Michigan, the, you go to the clerk's office and you take the document that has the notary um, stamp on it, let's say. And you go and they give you a document that has the seal on it like this. And uh, 
where it says seal of circuit court. I guess that's of Kent County, Michigan. Or is it for Kent County, Michigan? I think it's of. Right? Uh, and they put the certificate of authority on it. So this is the certificate they're talking about. Way back here where it said you had to have the uh, certificate under official seal of the notary. So just the notary itself isn't enough. Now you got, you're going to have to go to the clerk and get the clerk to do her thing. And they're going to do it on something like this where it says, I, you put your name in, I'd be the demanding, sign my name to this document on whatever day I have taken an oath administered by the officer whose signature and seal appears in this document swearing that the statements of this document are true. Well, that sounds like a sworn statement. I declare to the officer that this document is my will, okay, or my demand, that I will that I sign it willingly, that I execute it as my voluntary act, and that I'm 18 years or older and that I have sufficient mental capacity to do so. Okay, yeah, sign da 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 da. And then we, right, this is the two witnesses then. The witnesses sign our names to this document and have taken an oath administered by the officer whose signature and seal appear in this document. That all sounds about the same. Uh, the True, that the uh, individual signing this document as the testator, in my case the demandant, executes the document of his or her will, right? Just your free will, signs it willingly, or directs someone else to sign it, executes that other voluntary act, uh, expressed in the will, each of us in our in the in the presence of the claimant testator signs this will as witness to the testator signing. Why are they? What are they doing? They're witnessing the person sign the damn piece of paper. To the best of our knowledge, that the testator is over eighteen and under no constraint, undue influence. Blah blah blah. And then they sign it. And then you got the state of and county of. Now, I think this is very interesting. They put the state of because that's the official way that the state of Michigan is known. In the very first uh, constitution of Michigan, where it says that uh, we, the people of territory of Michigan, establish da, 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 and, uh, a free and independent state by the style and title of the state of Michigan. Well, they never use that anymore. They call it State of Michigan. They don't ever call it the State of Michigan. Sometimes they just use Michigan, but they never use the State of Michigan. And that the State of Michigan is in the Union. And the Union is the United States. Because the United States of America is the Confederation created under the Articles of Confederation. And United States of America is King George's jurisdiction. According to the Treaty of Peace, 18, uh, 1783. Right, but the state of Michigan. So this is like, you know, put using this document the way they're showing it would be putting it into the de jour um, you know, proper state of Michigan, the thing that was first created. We've had four, five constitutions for Michigan. Only one of them uses the state of Michigan as the style. All the rest use state of Michigan. And uh, seal, sign, official capacity to officer. Yeah. And then on top of this then, so you'd have this on the bottom of your document, all this blah, blah. And then you'd have to take this and the document to the uh County Clerk's Office had them give you a certificate of authority for the notary. And if you were to attach all that then to your whatever your document is that you have, you would have made it a sworn statement. It's like, okay, well now they have to they have to agree that's yours because your signature has been um, witnessed, testified to. Okay, so that's a lot of one way to do it. But then you read further on in this law, you get down to this part here where it talks about that instead of the testator or witnesses each making a sworn statement for an officer authorized to administer oaths as prescribed right, one and three, which we just looked at 
A will or codicil may be made self-proved by a written statement that is not sworn statement. Okay, an unsworn statement. Unsworn declaration. I don't know what that is. 28 U.S.C. 1746. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so you don't have to necessarily go to the notary. You can do it with an unsworn statement. This statement shall state or incorporate by reference to an attestation clause. Okay. Incorporate or reference to an attestation clause. So now we've got this new thing called an attestation clause. We've got to go see what that is. The facts regarding the testator and formalities of the signing a will, codicil as uh, prescribed, one and three, shall sign the statement which must include its execution date and must begin with substantially the following language. I certify or declare under penalty of perjury under the laws of the state of Michigan that blah, 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 blah. So you could use that in Michigan probate court. That's all this is really for. I ain't going to probate court. Right? I'm just trying to use the idea of the self-authenticated signature on a claim so that when they say well is that your signature it can be proved to them that it is and that using this format either this way with you know going to the do the trouble of going to the trying to get four people together in a room you know at the same time one of them being a notary get that part done and then go to the county building and get a freaking seal and so forth and get that done or instead try to do it this other way with uh, a attestation clause let's look at that uh, but before i leave you know i hope you can see by looking at this um, that doing this part here really isn't any different than they have you do on a uh, army sworn statement form you got the affidavit that uh, you have read and so forth and Witnesses sign. Right? So you make a statement, right? That's what the guy did. I declare. Right? I have read. That's, you know, his declaration, basically. So it, where it talked below here, that it either has to be, the reason I want to point that out is if you come down here, it said you got to have a no, certify or declare. You are going to declare if it's your affidavit. And the witnesses are going to certify if they're the ones uh, attesting to your signature. Okay, so what is an att attestation clause? Well, in statutory law, it's attestation clause is a clause typically appears uh, appended. I don't know why that thing is there. Back out of the way. Never mind. Up here to the will, often just below the place of the testator's signature. Okay, so the attestation clause goes just below where the claimant, because I'm not a testator, the demandant is going to sign. In the United States, an attestation clause were introduced into probate law with the proclamation of the first version of the model probate code in the 1940s. Statutes that authorize self-proved wills typically provide that a will that contains this thing will be admitted to probate without affidavit of testing witnesses. Well, we just read that about Michigan, that sure enough, you can do it, right? An attestation clause, model probate code language might provide, and then here's the things we're going to say. We, the under undersigned, testator and undersigned witnesses, respectively, whose names are signed this attached or foregoing instrument, declare... Uh, testator execute the instrument, uh, testator's will. That in place, uh, in the presence of both witness and testator, sign the acknowledged uh, signature. Signed or acknowledged the signature, right? Said, yes, that's my signature. So they didn't have to sign it, problem. You could just say, yeah, that's my signature. I signed it. Okay, you send it to the witnesses. They see the signature. They can put on there that you acknowledge it was your signature. Simple enough. Or they can all be there together at the same time and they can just say, well, we saw him write the damn thing down there. That's his signature. Free will, right? You got to tell them it's your free voluntary act. Got it. Uh, 
that each witness in the presence of the testator and each other signed. Okay, everybody signed in front of each other. We all saw what was going on. The testator's a sound mind. Uh, best knowledge over 18. Validity of the forms of testation is usually a matter of U.S. law. Okay, so what's the U.S. law say? Well, it says whenever, 28 U.S.C. 1741, the United States Code says whenever under any law of the United States or under any rule, regulation, order, or requirement made pursuant to law, any matter is required or permitted to be supported, evidence established or proved by the sworn declaration, verification, certificate, statement, oath, or affidavit in writing of the person making the same, other than a deposition, oath of office, and oath required special credit office official, other than the notary public. Such matter may, with like force and effect, be supported, evidence established or proved by the unsworn declaration, certificate, verification, or statement in writing of such person which is subscribed by him as true under penalty of perjury and dated in substantially the following form. All right, I executed, well, this is without the United States or within, so within. I have executed within the United States. I declare under penalty of perjury the foregoing is true and correct. Executed on something or other. Okay, so I could use that for the claim part because that's what I wanted to do. And, you know, I need, I need to prove my signature and I could do that with a sworn statement or oath or affidavit so I can do it with this because I'm not doing it for a deposition. I'm not doing it for an oath of office or an oath required to be taken before a special specified official. None of that happened. So it didn't say I take it like before a military officer. <clears throat> well, by the same token, then, um, when it comes to certifying, then so can the uh, the witnesses. They can certify. I certify under penalty of perjury the foregoing is true and correct. And they're going to be certifying whatever the attestation clause is, which is going to come immediately after my signature for my part where I was doing the um, the statement. What else we got? Uh, what do you hear? I declare I have read the foregoing document. The facts are stated in are true. Okay, I'd make it a, you know, basically that would make it a sworn statement. Statements of witnesses, attestation clause, examples, right? So first thing we see is they put the word attestation clause in the attestation clause. So there's no doubt that this is the attestation clause. So if you're going to do this, make sure you put an attestation clause name in before you start your thing, right? But they did it, and they, we, the undersigned witnesses, do hereby certify, right? Because now this is just for the witnesses. This isn't the claimant. He did his own thing already. This is for the witnesses. The attestation clause is for the witnesses. We, the undersigned witnesses, do hereby certify. They didn't declare. They certify. And attest, and attest, and attest, right? They, they you may see that on a on an exam sometime, right? And attest that the foregoing instrument is shown to us, signed, subscribed, published, declared. Da, da, da. So this is one for your last will and testament in New York. You get the idea, right? That they need to certify and attest that the foregoing instrument was shown to us, signed, and declared by the above named testator, or in my case, again, it'll be the demandant, right? And that makes an attestation clause, right? It's a provision at the end of an instrument, especially a will that is signed by the witness and recites the formalities required to make the instrument effective. A formal attestation clause itself can serve as prima facie evidence of the facts within the instrument. The attestator operates as a witness to confirm how a document was executed. In the uh, that's probably a good idea. Uh, the attestator. So you shouldn't call them a witness on a attestation clause. You should call them an attestator because that's the proper word for this thing we're doing. 
operates as a witness to confirm how a document was executed. In the context of wills, a testation clause is customary, but unlike the signatures of attesting witnesses, not necessary to validate execution of a will. Right? We do need to have the signature of attesting witnesses, but they could have done it under oath instead of doing it with uh, this attestation clause, because this attestation clause is here simply because you're not going to use a notary. Right? This is replacing the notary is by putting the attestation clause in. You know, little jots and tittles. Okay, however, there are one clause that should always be inserted in a will. This is the attestation clause, the part of the will that deals with witnessing the signature. I think we get that, right? Got to do that. What's execution? Uh, that's the act of signing, sealing, and legal instrument. Or giving it the forms required to render it a valid act. As the execution of a deed. Or the execution of your demand to make it legal. Attestation, the act of witnessing an instrument of writing at the request of a party making the same and subscribing it as a witness. You know, nobody's doing this stuff. I've never seen anybody that, that does attestation clauses on the documents they're filing into their court cases. All right, attestation clause, uh, the clause wherein the witness certify, not declare, state, no, nope, they certify. That's what witnesses do. The instrument has been executed before them and the manner execution of the same, the usual attestation clause to a will, signed, sealed, published, so forth and so on. That of deeds is generally, in the words, sealed and delivered in the presence of us. All right, signed, sealed, delivered. When there is an attestation clause in a will, unsubscribed by witnesses, presumption, uh, though slight, is that the will is in an unfinished state. Okay. Well, make sure they sign it then. So just for, you know, grins, then I'm going to use something like this on whatever it is I come up with to send with my demand to the Comptroller General where I declare to the attesting witnesses that this document is my free will act, that I sign it willingly, that by my signature I execute it, that I am 18 years of age or older and under no constraint or undue influence, and that I have sufficient mental capacity to make this claim, demand, against the government of the United States. Right? I declare under penalty of perjury the foregoing is true and correct. And then I'd sign it with my address because that's what it said to do Right? Under your signature and address. Well, my address includes Robert Allen Rodlewski. That's how you know it's addressed to me. All right? So there's your signature and there's my address. Then the attestation clause. We, the undersigned witnesses, one and two, respectively, hereby certify and attest, we believe the claimant demanded, I'm changing it, to be 18 years of older, sufficient mental capacity, he signed the foregoing die, confessed both at the same time, we attest his signature in the presence of him and each other. I serve under penalty of perjury, foregoing is true, all right, that's the first attestation witness, and I certify under penalty of perjury for the second one. And they do the same thing, put their name and then put their address, you know, what's whatever's on their driver's license. I even say you can put the driver's license number if you wanted to, but you know, I'm just doing what it said. They wanted to have your name and address. So check, 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 check the boxes. All right, so just kind of for a visual then, if you're writing, you know, a letter style of claim, this isn't the one I'm using. This is the one I sent to Lloyd and never made it to him, General Austin. Come, somebody's getting your mail, General. Right, uh, but then from here on down, this is where it all changes, and it would go over to using, uh, where are you at, here, you know, something like this. So, um, so is it a claim or a demand? Let's get through this real quick, and then we're going to go to you know, what you might do with the document before you actually send it to somebody. So they said claim or demand. So if you go to 
uh, Bouvier's Law Dictionary, and look at demand, it says uh, right, it's a claim, a legal obligation. Okay. Lord Coke says that a demand is a word of art and of an extent in its signification, uh, signification greater than any other word except claim. That's a hell of a thing to say. All right, Lord Coke, he wrote uh, the Institutus of the Laws of England, I think it was, back in the 14th century. Sat on the king's bench as the, you know, the grand poobah. And yada, yada, yada. All right, so it's, you know, it's him saying it, right? The, the grandfather of the laws of England, the common law of England, saying that of all the words that there are, uh... Other than claim, demand is the second greatest signification, is that word. Well, then we should probably know something about it. So in practice, a demand is a requisition or a request for one individual to another to do a particular thing. Well, it's, I want to be paid. Got it. Demands are either expressed or implied. Expressed or implied. In many cases, an express demand must be made before commencement of an action. So before you can do anything to sue, you have to demand. You can't claim until you demand. Right? Because claim, when used, you know, like uh, uppercase claim, then that's, we'll see, that's like a lien. Where demand is actually a claim. Ha, ha, ha. Smoke and mirrors. That's how they do their business. Right? So just call it demand. Get over it. A demand is frequently necessary to secure to a man all his rights. Okay, well, you got to demand it. Both in actions arise in the contracts of those founded on, on some tort. In other words, a crime. So if a crime has been committed against you, you need to make a demand. It is requisite also when it is intended to bring the party into contempt for not performing an order which has been made a rule of the court. Again, you have to demand they do something first before you can go in and claim, put a lien, and say, I want to lien you. You didn't demand it yet. Uh, okay, so you get the idea. It's requisite in some uh, case arising ex delicto. That's a crime to make ex delicto, delicto means a crime, arising in a crime, to make demand of restoration of a right before commencement of an action. In cases where the taking of goods is lawful, but their subsequent detention becomes illegal, it is also, it's absolutely necessary in order to secure sufficient evidence of the conversion on the trial to give a formal notice of the owner's right to the property and possession and to make a formal demand in writing of the delivery of such possession to the owner. The refusal to comply with such demand unless justified by some right which the possessor may have in the thing detained will in general afford sufficient evidence of a conversion. Well, this is exactly what we're, enlistees are going through right now. Our goods have been taken. You know, our pay. It's part of our goods. Now, it may have been done lawfully because, you know, we're not, we haven't, we've disappeared. And so now it's being put in an account. It's not being given to us, right? We don't have possession of it they have possession of it they're still writing the checks but they're putting them in an account someplace so it's absolutely necessary in order to secure sufficient evidence of a conversion on trial to give a formal notice of the owner's right to the property and possession and to make a formal demand in writing of the delivery of such possession to the owner so, does that mean you do notice and demand at the same time? I would say, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Notice and demand, right? That's the title of the document. That they refuse to comply, well then, right? Now it becomes illegal. It's evidence of a conversion that they refuse to comply. Uh, when in order to pay money or do anything has been made, a rule of court, a demand for payment of the money or performance of a thing must be made before an attachment will be issued for contempt. Well, Congress is a court. It's a legislative court. And it made a rule. It said if you want, uh, you got a claim for uh, pay, you need to you know, do A, B, and C. 
So if you do A, B, and C, and they don't do it, well then, you know, you've done the thing you needed to do, and now you can take it to court. Now this is the definition of claim, right? Claim, C-L-A-I-M. A claim is a challenge of ownership of a thing which a man has not in possession and is wrongfully withheld by another. Right? So a claim says it's being wrongfully withheld, and the demand is saying, you're holding my property, give it back to me. If they won't get it, well, then it's being unlawfully withheld, right? But until you've demanded it, it's not unlawful because they can legally be holding your property for you, right? We disappeared. So really what we want the Comptroller General to do is return us to military control. If you watch my previous videos, you'll know that, you know, we're, we, you need to be returned to military control. And then your absence can be excused, and they can settle the accounts, and uh, you can collect your pay, and if you're old enough, you can start collecting retirement pay, and all these other things can happen. But it starts by being acknowledged that you're still in the freaking military, which is the one thing they don't want to do. Because if we were all acknowledged veterans in the military, then beyond collecting our pay... We would have the authority to file charges and specifications against officers and employees in buildings displaying the flag of the United States on a flagpole or in a room that's got a gold fringe flag in it, right, that they're not following the law. And they'd have to take it from us. That's one way to do it. But now I found something else out that just here... In the last couple of days, it uh, you know adds a whole other layer to this, and that is right. You've done all this now. You want to give notice. You want to do everything the way that they say to. Well, then you know, and you got all this paperwork to give. How are you going to make sure that they actually get it? And there's some kind of proof that you actually did it, other than you mailing it to them. Right. So, like, where can I go record this? Where can I make a public record of this legal document before I send it? to whomever I'm sending it to. So, technically, I wouldn't even be sending them the original. The original would be, you know, that's the one that's going to go into the records, and you're going to get a certified copy. Right? So, like a certified copy of a court case, or can you file in the county clerk's office, or where can you file it? So, I was looking to see where you could file it, because I was thinking, well, this is really like testimony. And, uh, no, I don't want that one. That's not the right one. District court fees. All right, if you go to uh, district court miscellaneous fee schedule for the United States courts, this was affected December 1st, 2023. So I think they just changed this recently. Where it says, number one, for filing any document that is not related to a pending case or proceeding, $52. Okay, well, I'm going to create this document that has nothing to do with any uh, pre uh, pending case or proceeding in the court. Then they can file it for me for $52. Now, I thought it used to say somewhere here about, you know, you would be doing this to uh, perpetuate testimony for future use. Which is really what I'm doing. I mean, that we're, you know, this is my sworn statement done as a uh, demand, and I want to file my demand into the district court, basically putting the court on notice that this, you know, document exists. Or putting the United States on notice. It's not the court. The United States will be put on notice by putting it in here. So I think I'm going to do that. And then, uh, you know, and then I'll send it out to them. Well, then, as I was looking at this, now this is another. So I'll, let's just stop real quick. So what I just described to you, right, making up your statement using the uh, uh, attestation clause, you know, doing all that part right, without either with a notary or without, however you feel more comfortable, and getting that part done. And if you use a notary, remember, you got to go to the county clerk's office and get the certificate of authority. You know, get it all done, do it every jot and tittle, do them all. Then take it down to the district court and have them file it. Now, 
um, I, you know, I haven't finished what I'm writing yet, so I can't do it. But I'm going to call them and see, well, can I just mail it to you? Or do I got to actually come down there? Because, you know, it is really that convenient to go to the federal court. <clears throat> Especially in some places. I mean, here it's not so bad. But I know in a lot of places, it's miles and miles, hundreds of miles away from you. So, well, can you mail it to them? Because we're talking administrative stuff. You're going to mail it to the clerk. They're going to file it. They're going to give you certified copies. They're going to put them in an envelope. They're going to mail them back to you. What's that going to cost? Right? Send me an invoice. Put it all together. So, um, to do that. But as I was looking at these and I went down further, I saw this one processing fee for an offense charged on a federal violation notice. $30. Well, that's interesting, because I do have a thing. All right, so let's be really clear what it says. Uh, processing fee for an offense charged on a federal violation notice. Well, the United States Courts has a United States District Court violation notice. But, you know, those words aren't the same as this. It said a federal violation notice, not a United States District Court violation notice. This may be a style of one, but it isn't necessarily all of them, I guess is what I'm saying. And you can see on this, though, that you can be charged for violating the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations, or the United States Code, or your state code. Right? All those are different charges you can be charged with with this document. And if this is being filled out by the government, which, you know, this is like a government form, right? So the United States is the one filling this form out. Up here it says the United States should not be charged any fees. So this down here for this 30 bucks, they're not talking about the United States in this freaking form here. They're talking about you filing a notice, a federal violation notice, charging that somebody violated an offense, or uh, that somebody violated one of the laws, you're making a charge. So this is like charges and specifications, right? That you could charge somebody for an offense as a federal violation notice and take it down here and have it filed for $30 as a notice, right? Well, who are you noticing? Well, it's, you know, obviously it's a notice to the United States of a federal violation, and they would have to look at it then and determine if there was probable cause that there had been a violation. And then, you know, they would file the freaking complaint. So, you know, it's doing the same thing as this, except this is something used by federal agencies, and federal agencies don't pay to have their stuff filed, so that isn't what this is talking about. It's talking about you charging an offense of a uh, federal violation on a notice. So that would be the thing now. If I have done all these other things and I went and filed it here and I mail it to the address and I get the certificate back from UPS that has been, or USPS that has been mailed, all these other things have been done and then they, you know, don't settle the claim, well, then I can file a violation of uh, not filing the CFR or whatever it ends up being. I can think of lots of things to use this for, and that'll be a whole other video, but I'm just pointing out, well, ain't that something? For 30 bucks, you can file an offense of a violation of a federal law um, with the court. I don't know if anybody's ever done it. If you had, please tell me how you did it, and you know, share the, share the knowledge. If you filed anything under 15 in the federal court, Processing fee for offense charged on a federal violation notice. $30. Right, so if you're trying to get something done and you get to the point you can say, well, they're not doing this, I mean, which just happens all the time. Like in court, for instance, um, the attorneys never sign their paperwork. The, the, the complaint is never signed by the complaint. There's just all sorts of things that are wrong. <laughs> the clerk didn't process it properly through the clerk's office. You can put all those things in and then file this thing here. So this would be like petitioning the government for the redress of grievances. 
saying, well, this is what the law says, and they're not doing it. You put them on notice. Powerful tool if it works. I can't wait to try it. Uh, but that'll be here in a little bit because I got a few other things to do first. I'm just pointing it out now to those paying attention because, you know, if you got some kind of issue, this may be the way to get the issue taken care of quickly. So if you try something and it works or it doesn't work, I don't really care. If you try something using that, please let me know what happened. Send it to court of record at AOL.com. No S's on court or records. Court of record at AOL.com. And if you're trying to file documents in the court, well, here's one place at least you can record it. I think like in Wisconsin, they have a miscellaneous file in the district court. You're supposed to be able to record stuff there. But I've never heard that said here, and I don't really know how to get it done. I haven't found it listed on a fee schedule. I may go look closer now to see if there's such a thing. Right? But it's definitely written here that you can do it right here in the United States District Court. File any document that is not related to a pending case or proceeding for $52. You want to pay the money? They have to file the freaking paperwork. And then you get certified copies of it, and then that's what you would send out. And, uh, you know, you've given uh, actual notice to the United States that you filed this claim with the um, with the Comptroller General by doing it. So, hey, that was about it. But there seemed to be a lot of stuff there. You know, I mean, a lot of little details. And this is one of the biggest ones most recently for me is this, that, you know, they use the word claim, but really it's a demand. And that, as it turns out, any demand, right, not just for pay, any demand, right, all claims and demands, whatever, by the government of the United States or against it. See here it says government of the United States, not United States government. Demands by the government of the United States. I say that's me. I'm the one making the demand against the United States government, the people I have working for me, you're withholding my fucking pay. However they want to handle I don't really care. I'm just making the demand. Right? All demands. Or against it. And all accounts, whatever, in which the government of the United States is concerned, either as a debtor or creditor, shall be settled and adjusted in the General Accounting Office. And they can't change that. If you have a demand... You take it to the general accounting office. Let them figure out what to do with it. Right? So that's, you know, this is like petitioning the government for the redress of grievances. But don't call it a claim because that's a lien. It's a demand, which is a claim. And if you're confused on that, then you're going to have to go get the, you know, go get yourself a law dictionary. And uh, look at the definitions. Right? Demand compared to claim. Claim is a challenge of ownership of a thing in which a man is not in possession and is wrongfully withheld by another. Well, you can't say that happened, apparently, until you've demanded it first. A demand is uh, a requisition request by one individual to another to do a particular thing. Right? So we're asking the government to do something, petitioning the government to do something to a guy that's called the Comptroller General. Right? So he's a general officer, which he is. I mean, he's he's probably equal to a, a four-star general. I think they call it SES, Senior Enlisted, or Senior something or other. Um establishment but there's a whole group of civilians that have the same rank as generals so okay hey that's it for today We're running long on this one but that's the way she goes there's a lot to tell you hope you found it interesting and useful and uh if you got any information to share please send it to court of record at aol.com thanks much and have a great week and uh let you know how she goes talk to you later